Uh, last speaker this morning's program, um, Dr. Jing Zhang from our radiation oncology department. Uh, we'll be talking about advances in radiation therapy for kidney cancer. That will bring us to the end of our morning session. I know we're a little bit over, but uh, any of the speakers that can stay, I'd ask uh, the morning faculty to come down. If people have questions, uh, we'll turn the rest of you loose for our lunch break. So if we uh, finish up about 12.15, uh, panel can try and stay here until about 12.30. Why don't we plan to end lunch and we can be in at one o'clock? Okay? Thank you. I am mindful that I stand between you and lunch, so I'll try to talk <laughs> fast and I'm happy to stay for questions. So. Um, as Dr. Taikoti introduced, um, my name is Jean Zen. I am a radiation oncologist um, working at the University of Washington, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, as well as our Proton Therapy Center. I think um, most people are not too familiar with radiation if you haven't been through the process yourself or have a family, you know, close, someone close to you who's gone through it. So some, these are some of the most basic questions I get from patients about radiation treatment, which is radiation comes from a machine. And so the way that you're treated is actually feels a lot like getting a CT scan. You're basically lying on your back on this table and there are going to be therapists and technologists kind of moving all around you in the room and there's a machine that's going to move around you as well. There's no radioactive material um, anywhere in the room. The only time there's radiation is when you're in the room by yourself and the machine is on. Um, <laughs> This is a little different from a type of radiation called brachytherapy where they're actually implanting radioactive material into you. It's used most often in prostate cancer, but it's pretty much never used for kidney cancer treatment. And you don't see the radiation, you don't feel the radiation, just like when you're getting an x-ray or you know, a CT scan. You don't even know when the machine is on, except for this, instead of you know, scanning a whole section of your body, we're aiming at one particular, hopefully small section of your body. And so, the goal of radiation therapy, probably like all of my other colleagues, is always to kill cancer cells and try not to kill too many of the normal cells that are around in that region. Um, decades ago, and we still do this as well, which is the simplest kind of radiation is we treat people with these rectangular shaped treatment fields. And so, for example, on the left here is an x-ray of the pelvis. Um, this is a patient who had a cancer, for example, kidney cancer, that's gone to a couple um, spots in their spine, so a lumbar vertebral body as well as their sacral. Um, and we're basically treating them with this rectangular um, radiation field to try to treat the cancer in those bones that are most likely causing pain or causing um, nerve damage by by compressing some of the nerves in that area. This is a patient who had cancer that spread to their brain, um, and so we're actually giving whole brain radiation in this particular incidence, and you're basically seeing the shape of the radiation field here. This part is blocked so that we're, there's no point to needlessly treat the eye or the mouth or anything like that, but we're aiming to treat the whole brain with radiation. Um, over the past few decades, there's been a lot of advancements in radiation technology, so you're hearing more th about things like radio surgery. Um, Cyberknife, for example, is a brand that a lot of people have heard of. It's a type of radio surgery made by a particular company. But basically, the goal of this is instead of treating you with rectangular-based radiation fields, there's a lot of different radiation beams that are all coming from different directions so that they all converge on a tumor, so that you're getting a high dose of the tumor, but lower dose elsewhere in the body. So for example, if you had a tumor, this is a CT scan of the lung, um, a cross section of your lung, and this little red circle is outlining a tumor in the lung that's been growing. So for example, it's spread from the kidney to the lung, and we want to kill this tumor with radiation. And so what we do is we give this treatment called radio surgery or cyber knife or you know, SBRT, and you just have a lot of different beams of radiation, all little beams of radiation coming from different directions. They're all converging on this lung tumor so that the different Different color lines are representing kind of higher and higher doses of radiation. So you get a full dose of radiation to the lung tumor, and then as you move away from the lung tumor, the radiation dose falls off very quickly to elsewhere all around. Um, I think a lot of people are also starting to ask me more and more about proton therapy because they're starting to hear about it. Um, what I tell patients is proton radiation, it's still a type of radiation. It's a FDA approved technology. It delivers radiation to the tumor and theoretically it may be able to reduce radiation to some of the surrounding normal tissue. And it's useful sometimes, not all times. And I also say it's a tool for the radiation oncologist, meaning, you know, just like SBRT, radio surgery, cyber knife are tools. And it's only useful when you need radiation. If you don't need radiation, then you don't need proton therapy. So the major difference, um, I won't go too much into the physics, 
but the major difference between proton radiation and regular radiation. Regular radiation is represented here by this red curve um, called photon or x-ray radiation. There are different names for it, but I'll just call it regular radiation. And what this is representing is depth into your body versus the um, relative dose of the radiation. So what happens with regular radiation is it goes into your body, it reaches its maximum dose damage at some point, some depth in your body, and then it actually exits out your body at some point, so it travels through and through. And so that's why earlier when I showed the figure of the lung radiation, you have a lot of different beams that come from different directions. They all exit as well, but you're, since you're converging on a particular point, the dose is high at that point and then becomes much lower as you move away from it. With proton radiation, the major difference is it goes into your body. It's represented by this purple curve here. It goes into your body, reaches a certain calculated depth, and then stops. And there's no radiation coming out the other side. And so, it, unfortunately, most of the time we're not treating a one millimeter a large tumor. You're treating a much larger tumor, you know, two, three, four centimeters. And so in order to get that kind of depth coverage, you have a lot of these little purple curves that will eventually add up to this green curve. And so, when is it a good idea to use proton radiation? Usually it's because you're trying to treat a particular tumor to a high dose, but there is a critical organ next to it that you don't want to give quite as high of a dose to. We treat a lot of children at our proton center because in them, um, they typically have decades more to live, so you worry about other side effects that are long-term, like cancer from the radiation, or development or growth delays or organ damage. We also do this a lot when we're trying to retreat the same area because your body has a lifetime memory for radiation, so it's hard to treat the same area over and over multiple times. So usually when we talk about proton radiation, the poster image that we're talking about is treating pediatric um, cranial spinal radiation. There are certain kinds of children um, with brain tumors where their cancer is actually likely to spread from the brain all down the fluid, down the entire spine. So they end up needing radiation to not only their brain, but their entire spine as well. The cure rates for these kinds of tumors are actually relatively high. Overall, it's about 80% cure rate, meaning 80% of these children are going to live for several decades after treatment. And so when you treat them with regular radiation, because the radiation goes in from the back and comes out from the front, you're not only treating the spine, but as these cross-sectional images show, you're also treating everything in front of the spine. So the heart here, for example, the bowels, the liver. Whereas with proton radiation, the radiation goes in, covers the spinal cord, and then stops. And so this is probably the one scenario where you have the most amount of advantage from treating with proton radiation versus regular radiation. But there are also, also scenarios in the abdomen. So for example, again, I think Dr. Tycote discussed that there is currently no evidence to give radiation after surgery for kidney cancer if it's localized. But there are certain kinds of ch um, children with certain kinds of kidney cancer, specifically Wilms tumor, where it's actually standard for them to get radiation to the entire post-operative bed after they have their kidney removed their kidney cancer. And so if you imagine, if you're treating that whole area on a scan like this, if you use regular radiation and you're kind of going front to back, then not only are you treating where the kidney used to be, which is kind of back here, but you're also treating a lot of liver needlessly for you know, no benefit. Whereas if you treat with something like proton radiation, you can have a radiation beam go in from the back, treat the entire post-operative bed, and not have to rad give excess radiation to the um, liver in the front. Similarly, this is a patient who had a metastatic tumor that was in the anterior abdominal wall, so kind of on the front part of the abdomen. And if you're using something like protons that stops after a certain distance, you get to treat the tumor just like you do with standard radiation, regular radiation, without having excess radiation kind of spill out. And so what exact, So that's kind of the basics of radiation technology, different kinds of radiation. What exactly are the reasons that you are most likely to see me um, if you have kidney cancer, a radiation oncologist? Um, you're most likely to see me if you have metastatic disease and there's a particular site that's causing a problem or about to cause a problem, meaning it's symptomatic, meaning you know, usually you're having pain because it's compressing, it's growing a bone or compressing a nerve. There's airway compression, there's bleeding um, because of the particular tumor, or there are sites that are less likely to respond to systemic therapy like brain because there's a special lining in your brain called the blood-brain barrier, so a lot of drugs that Dr. Tycote gives don't work as well in the brain as you do in other parts of the body. There's also a couple of special scenarios where we use radiation to treat what we call oligoprogressive disease, as well as you've already heard, heard it hinted at, um, the combination of radiation and immunotherapy to enhance the efficacy of immunotherapy. 
And so what do I mean by oligoprogressive disease? And so as Dr. Tycote's treatments improve, believe it or not, that actually gives me more to do as a radiation oncologist because the better your systemic therapy um, treatments are, then the more likely it is that it will matter that we need to treat one or two or three specific sites that are problematic. And so this is illustrating the concept of kind of disease progression for a patient with metastatic cancer. So for example, these blue dots in this patient are supposed to be representing different sites of metastasis. So you have a couple long nodules, you have a spot in the liver, and you have a spot in the bone in the pelvis. And these patients are on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatment, of which something like Sutent, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And so at first, these drugs, these um, spots of cancer all respond to the treatment that you're on, and they're all controlled. But unfortunately, cancer cells mutate over time, and they develop resistance. And so at some point, what happens is you can have one spot, this little red spot here, that then is starting to grow um, through the Sutent treatment, for example. And so, of course, if all of your spots are growing at the same time through Sutent, then it's probably too toxic to, radi to use radiation to treat all the spots at once. But if you have one or two or three particular spots that are growing, but other spots are responding, what you can do is you can then use radiation or surgery to treat those particular spots that are progressing in the hope that you know then you have more time on the therapy that's working that you're tolerating. So for example, give more time to suit and to work instead of now having to stop that and moving on to something else that may or may not be as effective and may or may not be more toxic. And so I think the key here is oligo, meaning a few, which is radiation has side effects as well. So we can it's only worth doing if there's you know a few spots. And the definition of a few changes from study to study as well. And so, you know, I think some of this data comes from patients with lung cancer because as we saw from Dr. Tycote's chart, there are just many more of them than patients with kidney cancer. But these are patients who are on various kinds of these kind of smart drugs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, different ones than, are, than the ones that are used to treat kidney cancer, but similar concept that they are on these tyrosine kinase inhibitors for basically metastatic stage four lung cancer. Um, the, Therapy initially works for a while, so the median progression-free survival, so it works for about nine months on this one drug called crizotinib. It works for about 13 and 0.8 months for this other drug called bilotinib, but then at some point, these patients are developing progression through these drugs. And what they do is, for patients who have less than um, four sites of progression, they then gave pretty high doses of radiation or surgery to the sites that are growing. And on average, they were able to buy patients another six months on the same drug, instead of having to switch drugs in, um, entirely. And that is of meaning as well, because you get to continue on a therapy that is still effective and is having a tolerable side effect profile. So that's one um, possibility. Another role for radiation um, in metastatic renal cell carcinoma is in conjunction with immunotherapy because radiation, we're hoping, can work like a vaccine. And so I won't get too much into kind of the, uh, the basics of it, but basically radiation triggers what we call an immunogenic cell death meaning it kills the cancer cell, releases a bunch of proteins from the cancer that are hopefully different than the proteins that your normal body has, because again, a cancer cell is a mutated cell. It also releases a lot of chemical signals that causes an inflammatory environment so that immune cells go in and kind of are a little bit revamped into kind of responding and developing an immune response. And so this is the obscopal effect Dr. Tycote referred to, which is if you have a patient who has cancer in multiple parts of the body and you give radiation to one site, that, like that red circle, presumably a tumor in the right arm here, you're hopefully re releasing a bunch of tumor-associated antigens, so abnormal mutated proteins from the cancer cells. And they're being recognized by these antigen-presenting cells as this is not normal. They will then float around over to the lymph nodes in your body and kind of help grow a population of immune cells, T-cells, T cells that are hopefully going to be specific to the cancer float all over the body and get the cancer wherever they are, not just where you treated them. That's kind of the ideal. It's unfortunately an extraordinarily rare phenomenon to see, and so it's limited to a handful of case reports and literature. So for example, this report is talking about a 61-year-old gentleman who had a nephrectomy in 2008 for a clear cell type renal cell carcinoma and was noted at the time of surgery to already have the cancer spread to the left adrenal right above the kidney. And unfortunately, about a month after the surgery, they saw that the patient actually had bilateral lung nodules and abnormal lymph nodes, as well as the cancer spread to the bone in a couple of thoracic 
for T bodies, T8 and T10. And so they gave radiation to those spots in the vertebral body, um, 40 gray and five fractions. That's a very reasonable SBRT dose, aggressive dose to give for um, spinal meds. The patient did not get any systemic therapy. There was no evidence of pulmonary infection or in any symptoms of it. And what they saw surprisingly was, of course, the radiated lesions in the spine, in the bone, responded, but the untreated lesions, the multiple lung mets and lymph nodes, actually also regressed. And so what this is showing is, this is a diagnostic um, CT scan showing this is a tumor in the lung that should not be there. This is right after the surgery, before any treatment. This is about two months after radiation to the spine, so in a, so in a different part of the body. This was not treated with radiation. In August, it continued to get smaller. And again, this is a patient who's not on any kind of systemic therapy. And for the published report, they said that three years later in 2011, the patient was still alive and well with no new metastatic disease. The patient did have brain mets that were treated with radiosurgery, which I don't know if you recall a few minutes ago, I said the brain is a very different part of the body because it's protected by the blood-brain barrier, so the immunologic environment is felt a little different. And so this is kind of the dream for the obscopal effect for radiation, but like I said, it's extraordinarily rare. And so a more likely use of radiation is in conjunction with immunotherapy that's already being used to try to make them more effective. So as Dr. Tycote alluded to, IL-2, it's a very common used immunotherapy. It's quite toxic as well, but the overall response rate isn't particularly high. So this is one study, for example, that came out in 1995 that looked at over 200 patients with metastatic, so stage four renal cell carcinoma, that were treated with high dose IL-2, and unfortunately, Everyone gets treated, but the overall response rate is only about 14%. And so out of 100 patients, only 14%, 14 patients showed a response to this treatment. With a complete response, meaning you know all of your sites of disease have disappeared, only 5% out of 100. Um, and partial response, meaning you know there's shrinkage of tumors, but they're not gone, about 9%. And the figure on the right is showing for the 14% lucky patients that actually showed a response, how long do they respond? Well, the ones who had um, a complete response, median duration of response was more than three years, median duration of response was about 19 months, so a year and a half for those who showed a partial response. And so can radiation help make these odds better? There was a very small study that was published um, back in 2012 that looked at SBRT, so high dose radiation to a small area plus IL-2. And they only had 12 patients, five with renal cell, five with melanoma, because both groups of patients are treated with these IL-2 treatment. And they gave high doses of radiation, 20 gray, one to three treatments. And the goal was it must end three days before starting IL-2, because you're going for that inflammatory reaction and you're trying to start your immunotherapy before the inflammatory reaction fades from the radiation. And they actually, unfortunately, there was only you know small numbers, so only five patients with renal cell, but they saw a 60% um, complete or partial response rate with this group of patients who were treated with SBRT plus um, IL-2, which is much higher than the 14% we saw in the last study. So that's very encouraging. So there's a larger study that's being done now. We don't have the final results yet. So this is called an interim analysis, where similarly, they're giving high doses of radiation to a small area, one to three fractions. They treated, they're allowed to treat up to six sites, but the median is usually two. So it's hard to treat a lot of sites of the body without causing excess toxicity. And again, the goal is that the radiation and the IL-2 must start within about three days of each other. And they had about 15 patients that have a long enough follow-up that they felt actually like they could conclude something. And right now, their response rate is about 53%. So again, higher than what you usually expect to see with IL-2 by itself. And so mm -hmm. Dr. Tycote and I have started treating a few patients kind of off protocol on this regimen. And they did not see any significant increase in toxicity when you combine the radiation plus the IL-2 versus just the IL-2 by itself. And so we've heard a lot about PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors. I promised Dr. Tycote I would not have that figure with the checkpoint inhibitors inhibiting each other. But basically, um, checkpoint inhibitors are trying to release one of the breaks on the immune system to help your body mount a more robust immune response against the cancer. And this is the Checkmate um, 025 study that Dr. Tycote actually mentioned in his um, question and answer session, which is for patients who have metastatic stage four renal cell carcinoma, who already received some kind of therapy and their cancer progressed through it, they tested nivolumab 
versus what was what was more standard of care second line therapy at the time ever Lyme is and with over 800 patients that were enrolled they found that the molumab this PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor this immunotherapy is more effective the median survival was 25 month versus 19 month and it was also less toxic so grade three four adverse events Usually grade five adverse events are death. Three to four is serious. Four is usually meaning like hospitalizations. Grade three adverse events are usually, you know, needed hydration, lots of meds, maybe hospitalization. So it's both more effective and better tolerated. And so that's what's now made it a more attractive therapy for a lot of patients. But again, the problem is the response rate. Now, with the volume app, the response rate is 25%, which is a lot higher than the 5% you were getting with the standard therapy. But complete responses were only about 1% um, with the volume app. And the median duration of response is only about a year. So what has a lot of people excited about immunotherapy is when you're looking at a survival curve like this, and so this x-axis being time, so month, and then this being probability of progression-free survival, a lot of the time with these immunotherapy agents, you see what they call a tail, meaning it doesn't work for a lot of patients, but there's a small group of patients, and this one about 15 to 20%, where it works, and it works for a really long time. And so the question is, you know, the reason that there's so many combination immunotherapy trials out is we like this tail, but how do you make this tail higher so that you're benefiting a much larger proportion of patients? And so there's been a lot of studies looking at radiation and PD-1 checkpoint inhibition because radiation actually affects T cells, your immune cells, through the PD-1 pathway. And radiation like SBRT can actually induce PD-L1 expression in tumor-associated tumor lymphocytes as well as increase PD-1 expression. And so it works well that when you then block it that they might work synergistically together. There's a lot of studies in mice that will have survival curves that look like this, where you have time on one side, you have percent survival on another um, on the y axis and what they're showing is usually that they took a bunch of mice gave them some kind of tumor and there's usually always a control group that gets no treatment at all they usually die the fastest and then there will be another group that gets just radiation there'll be another group that just gets the immunotherapy and those two therapies may help the mice live a little longer but not too much longer and then radiation plus immunotherapy together will be the group that does the best and even have some mice that are cured of their cancer with a combination of two so they've done this for a lot of different cancer types and a lot of different kinds of specific drugs but we have yet to prove this in people so and so there's also been trials looking at this in people and you know beyond just radiation and immunotherapy what else can you add to the cocktail to augment the response and another promising candidate are drugs that inhibit a pathway called PI3 kinase. You don't have to know what that is other than it's a molecular signaling pathway that your cancer cells use to manage to grow and escape being killed by your immune system, the drugs, et cetera. And so there's, it actually helps to augment um, response to radiation. This is a phase two trial that took a bunch of patients that have lung cancer, again, many more patients with lung cancer than kidney cancer, they added um, this drug called nalfinavir, which inhibits PI3 kinase pathway to the regular chemo radiation that people get and found a much higher than expected response rate in these patients. And luckily, the same drug, the PI3 kinase, it actually also augments response to checkpoint inhibitors. And so this, for example, is a study that looked at mice that were given a particular kind of cancer, um, which they found that if you give this particular kind of PI3 kinase pathway inhibitor, it helps to reverse another group of cells that are suppressing the immune system, myeloid derived suppressor cells. And so what that ultimately adds up to is that you're hoping that if you combine all three, then you you have a tumor, you're radiating the tumor, it's releasing a bunch of tumor-specific proteins that are being captured by your immune system, taken to your lymph nodes, your immune system is trying to mount an immune response, these checkpoint inhibitor drugs like nimolumab is then helping to augment that immune response, and then an additional drug, this nalfinavir, the PI3 kinase inhibitor, is helping to decrease the suppression of that immune response. And so we've recently actually opened up a clinical trial here trying to incorporate all these concepts for patients with various kinds of metastatic cancer, including renal cell carcinoma, also melanoma, lung cancer, where they're getting nivolumab, so the checkpoint inhibitor therapy that's FDA approved for metastatic um, 
renal cell carcinoma, they get radiation to a single site of disease, and on very high doses of radiation, just three treatments, and they get this drug, this PI3 kinase inhibitor, and the goal of all of this is to basically increase the number of patients that one, have a response to immunotherapy, and two, has a durable response to immunotherapy. And so I think I'll stop standing between us and lunch and end there. So happy to take questions. Yes. Why just the Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's always been an active area of debate. So, you know, like you said, the study in Texas, technically they allow up to six, but the median was two, meaning the more of your body that we treat, the more we're concerned about causing side effects. And so with the radiation, it's really meant to be a vaccine, um, meaning, you know, to give a booster shot. And so it's felt that if you're giving a high enough dose, a booster shot to one site should be as effective as, you know, zapping six sites at once and a lot less toxic. So yeah. if you needed more sites to be treated because, you know, medically you need more treatment, that's okay. But the protocol specifically says, you know, you have to treat at least one. So, yeah. What's the difference between high dose, few high doses and a long term many doses? Yeah, so usually size is a part of it, meaning, you know, with radiation, we, we can't kill you with the radiation treatment. And so if you're treating a large area, you can't give a mass dose of radiation to a large area. It's not safe. Um, right now, you know, historically, the way that radiation and surgery have always worked is you have a tumor that we can see. And if you're having surgery to that tumor, your surgeon will not only take out that tumor, but they'll frequently take out some lymph nodes around it to make sure it hasn't spread. And so radiation, similarly, often when we treat a cancer, there's the cancer that we see, but then we'll prophylactically treat a bunch of lymph nodes around the area to make sure that you know, we get any cancer cells that might be trying to escape. It's actually a reverse in our thinking now as we're trying to partner with immunotherapy because as I showed, the immune response is mounted in the lymph nodes next to the tumor. And so we're now actually intentionally trying to keep our radiation fields as small as possible so that we're not interfering with the you know, immune response that your lymph nodes are trying to generate. There's even some people that are advocating that we shouldn't even bother treating the whole tumor. We should just treat the little middle part of it because again, you're just giving it as a booster shot like a vaccine. So why bother you know, trying to treat the whole tumor Tumor when you're just trying to kill enough of it to augment a immune response. But it is not safe to give a high dose of radiation to a large area. So it's only safe to do that to a small area. Um, that, that's probably something for your radiation oncologist to answer. But usually we don't like doing it if we're treating more than five centimeters. Um, if you're trying to give the kind of SBRT kinds of doses and something's much, a uh, tumor's greater than five centimeters, it becomes less safe to do so. so. Lots of small doses is as good as a couple of large doses? For generating an immune response, no, um, because we know that when you're give so radiation actually kills immune cells, um, believe it or not. And so that's why when you see these studies, they're all meant to be very few doses of radiation so that we generate an immune response without killing it later. If I keep radiating you know, the same area for six weeks, for example, I will generate an immune response initially, but then I'm gonna kill that immune response later down the road. And so that's why when you look at the clinical trials that do this, it's usually like one to three doses of radiation so that you generate an immune response and then you stop affecting that immune response with the radiation. If you're just trying to kill off a tumor, then we also like giving high doses as high as possible, as quickly as possible. But again, you have to factor that with safety because if you're trying to kill off the tumor, then sometimes it's not safe to give a very high dose over a very short period of time.